but I want to begin reading verse 1 and down to verse 13. It says this, And Hezekiah sent to all Israel and Judah, and wrote letters also to Ephraim and Manasseh, that they should come to the house of the Lord at Jerusalem to keep the Passover unto the Lord God of Israel. For the king had taken counsel and his princes and all the congregation in Jerusalem to keep the Passover in the second month. For they could not keep it at that time because the priests had not sanctified themselves sufficiently, neither had the people gathered themselves together to Jerusalem. And the thing pleased the king and all the congregation. So they established a decree to make a proclamation throughout all Israel from Beersheba, even to Dan, that they should come to keep the Passover unto the Lord God of Israel at Jerusalem, for they had not done it of a long time in such sort as it was written. So the posts went with the letters from the king and his princes throughout all Israel and Judah, and according to the commandment of the king, saying, Ye children of Israel, turn again unto the Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, and he will return to the remnant of you that are escaped out of the hand of the kings of Assyria. And be not like your fathers and like your brethren, which trespassed against the Lord God of their fathers, who therefore gave them up to desolation, as you see. Now be ye not stiff-necked as your fathers were, but yield yourselves unto the Lord and enter into his sanctuary, which he hath sanctified forever. And serve the Lord your God, that the fierceness of his wrath may turn away from you. For if you turn again unto the Lord your brethren and your children shall find compassion before them that lead them captive. So that they shall come again into this land, for the Lord your God is gracious and merciful and will not turn away his face from you if you return unto him. So the posts passed from city to city throughout the country of Ephraim and Manasseh, even unto Zebulun, <clears throat> and they laughed them to scorn and mocked them. Nevertheless, diverse of Asher and Manasseh and of Zebulun humbled themselves and came to Jerusalem. Also in Judah, the hand of God was to give them one heart to do the commandment of the king and of the princes by the word of the Lord. And there assembled at Jerusalem much people to keep the Feast of Unleavened Bread in the second month, a very great congregation. And then just one uh, brief New Testament reading, which will give us our title this evening. And it's from 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and verses 7 and 8, where it says, Purge out therefore the old leaven, that you may be a new lump, as you are unleavened. For even Christ, our Passover, is sacrifice for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. And I want to borrow from those words, uh, really a title that I'd like to put over this chapter. And that is this little phrase in verse 8. Therefore, let us keep the feast. Because really... That's what's going on in this chapter, chapter 30 of Second Chronicles, is that now that the temple has been effectively cleansed, uh, the priests have sanctified themselves, the doors are now open for business, uh, the peace offering, uh, the sin offering has been offered, and now uh, there's a time to get back to the festivals uh, that the nation should have been keeping. And of course, it's the first month. And you know and I know that uh, from the Old Testament, on the 14th day of the first month at even, they were to keep the Passover. But there was a little bit of a problem. So we're going to kind of examine that in this chapter. But I'm running ahead of myself. I don't want to do that. And so Hezekiah's life story, we want to just kind of go back to Hezekiah. His life story seems to revolve around letters, both good and bad. The good ones he sent and the bad ones he received. So he wrote good letters and he got bad ones back. 
<clears throat> and so, for instance, here in this chapter, he sent letters to all Israel. Look at verse 1. Hezekiah sent to all Israel and Judah and wrote letters also to Ephraim, Manasseh, that they should come to the house of the Lord of Jerusalem, keep the Passover to the Lord God of Israel. Notice again verse 6. So the post went with the letters from the king and his princes throughout all Israel and Judah, and according to the commandment of the king, saying, you children of Israel, turn again to the Lord, so on and so forth. Verse 10. So the post passed from city to city through the country of Ephraim, Manasseh, even to Zebulun, but they laughed them to scorn and mocked them. Do you get the idea? He's sending letters and their invitation letters and their invitation letters to not just the whole of Israel, but even the northern kingdom. Remember the 10 tribes. Some of them have gone into captivity. There's a, a, taken captive by Assyria, but there's a remnant that are still there. And he wants to include and invite them to come back to Jerusalem for the Passover. And so he writes these letters, but he also received some letters. And I'd like us to look at Second Kings now, just to see the letters that he received. Uh, and one of them was a threatening letter in chapter uh, 19 of Second Kings and verse 14. It says, and Hezekiah received the letter of the hand of the messengers and read it. And Hezekiah went up into the house of the Lord and spread it before the Lord. And if you know anything about the story of, of Hezekiah, it was a threatening letter from Sennacherib, king of Assyria, basically threatening to invade Judah and to take Jerusalem. And so it was a letter of threat. And of course, we read there what he did with it. He took it to the house of the Lord, presented it before the Lord. And then in chapter 20 of 2 Kings, he receives another letter, having resisted uh, the uh, the letter of um, Sennacherib and uh, the Lord delivering uh, Israel from the Assyrians, he gets a letter of praise in chapter 20 and verse 12. And it says, at that time, Beradak Baladan, son of Baladan, king of Babylon, sent letters and presents to Hezekiah for he had heard that Hezekiah had been sick. And I want to just say this right at the start, that Hezekiah did better with the threatening letters than he did with the letters of praise. When he got the threatening letter, remember he went to, with Isaiah to the house of God, he spread the letter out, and he said, Lord, look at what, what they're saying, look at their threats, and God heard his cry, and he, it was handled beautifully. And so he could, he could deal with the threats of the enemy easier than he could do with the, deal with the praise that came from Baladan uh, in uh, Babylon. And again, it's interesting, I think, for all of us, sometimes the Lord's people can deal with the enemy's attacks easier than they can deal with praise. Because one of the problems with praise is that we tend to get carried away with pride and we listen to what people say and we start to think we're something special and all the rest of it. And then we can't be used by God. And so just interesting that his whole life revolves around letters, letters, both good and bad, good ones he sent, bad ones he received. And how did he handle those things? But one thing we learned last time when we saw uh, when the temple was reconstituted, that when he asked for sin offerings to be offered, he asked that it would be done for all Israel. And so even though this king is the king of Judah, he has a heart that reaches out beyond the immediate people of God to the whole nation. And uh, he certainly, we see that zeal again here. He wants to keep the Passover and he's not content just to have the, as it were, the Jerusalem holy huddle but he wants to extend an invitation to those of Israel, to those of Manasseh, to those of Zebulun, uh, to those of Ephraim, these various uh, northern tribes. He, he's just got this huge heart, and it's, it's an amazing combination, really. Uh, it, clearly, he's got a zeal to keep the commandments of God, and it's a very narrow 
zeal. In other words, he wants to do it God's way, but he has a wide heart that embraces all the people of God. And it's so hard to have that kind of mindset where you love the truth. And I suppose like the Lord Jesus, you can somehow get that balance of being full of grace and truth. Sometimes we're all truth and no grace, or we're all grace and no truth. He has a heart for all the people of God, and yet he's got very narrow convictions himself about how things should be done. So he sends these letters to all Israel and invites them to the feast. Now, the letters are very carefully worded. And I want us to see this. He, he's not basically uh, asking Israel to join them in a way that is peace at any price. He wants them to come and join in, but he wants there to come with genuine repentance. And I want you just to notice verses six through nine, uh, these letters that are sent, they're, they're not kind of sugarcoating anything. They're, they're basically demanding that if they do come, and he wants them to come, that they come having returned to the Lord. So again, I want you to notice uh, again, verse six, the post went with the letters from the king and his princes throughout all Israel and Judah, according to the commandment of the king, saying, ye children of Israel, turn again to the Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, and he will return to the remnant of you that are escaped out of the hand of the kings of Assyria. And remember the northern tribes had been in a very backslidden condition, even since the very earliest days of the kings of Israel. They had worshipped at Bethel and Dan. They'd set up their groves, their idols, their false priesthood. And so what he says to them is, we want you to come to the Passover with us, but not come as you are. You need to repent. You need to turn to the Lord. And he gives them a, a wonderful promise. And by the way, this promise is found just as clearly in the New Testament. James would say the very same words in James chapter 4 to any backslider, any person that's gotten away from the Lord. He would say this, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. And that's all he's saying to them. He, he says very clearly in verse 6, he says it, that um, if they would turn again to the Lord God of Abraham, Isaac and Israel, he will return to the remnant of you that escaped. So first of all, they've got to turn away from their idolatry and they've got to turn back to God in genuine repentance. And he says, if you do that, God will turn to you uh, and it, it, he will indeed uh, restore you. And so notice again, verse seven, be not like your fathers and like your brethren, which trespassed against the Lord God of their fathers, who therefore gave them up to desolation be not stiff-necked as your fathers were, but yield yourselves to the Lord and enter into his sanctuary, which he has sanctified forever, that his wrath might, the fierceness of his wrath might turn from you. So really, it's a, it's a wonderful invitation to come and keep the feast, but to make sure that you're in the right condition to keep the feast, that you have truly repented. And when we think about our feast, we have a remembrance feast and it's, it's a wonderful festival. And yet um, I want to say this about the table that we have. Uh, sometimes people say, oh, you know, you have an open table or you have a closed table. I don't know if you've ever heard that language or whatever. You probably have. But let me just say this. In one sense, our table is not an open table because if you're under discipline, from your assembly, you're not welcome to break bread at our assembly unless you have repented and been received back into fellowship. So we're not an open table. Uh, and so on the one hand, there's a corporate responsibility, right? So to, when somebody comes to visit, do they have a letter? Are they, are they from an assembly where they're in happy fellowship? We're not open. On the other hand, there's, there's not just a corporate re re responsibility, when it comes to our feast, there's an individual responsibility. The Lord says through the Apostle Paul, let a man examine himself, right? So there's the corporate responsibility. We, we can't receive somebody that's got false doctrine, uh, that's 
that's not in fellowship in their assembly, that's under discipline. Uh, we can't do that. Neither uh, is it just a corporate responsibility. It's also the personal responsibility. Let a man examine himself. And so basically he writes these letters to them, but he wants them to come, not just as they are, but he wants that he's not being ecumenical. He wants unity with all the people of God, but unity based on truth, that faith once and for all delivered Old Testament wise to the saints. And they're not to be stiff necked, but they're to yield themselves fully to the Lord. I love that term stiff necked. Uh, Stephen will use it in his sermon uh, in Acts chapter seven and verse 51. Let me just read it from Stephen's lips. A powerful, powerful sermon as he's speaking to Jews. And uh, he, he makes this incredible statement. He says, you stiff necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, you do always resist the Holy Ghost as your fathers did, so do ye. Now, what does it mean to be stiff necked? Well, a stiff necked person can't bow, right? And you remember what the Lord said, take my yoke upon you, learn of me. Well, in order to get under that yoke, you have to bow down to get it on, right? And, and so a stiff necked person is refusing to come and take Christ's yoke. Come unto me, all you that labor heavy laden, I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. And to get that yoke on, you got to bow. And a stiff-necked person, oh no, I can't do that, right? And so don't be stiff-necked. And so uh, there's no attempt on any way on, on the part of Hezekiah to sugarcoat the message, to make it more palatable, uh, to make it more entertaining, uh, to make it more seeker-sensitive. He He sincerely invites them but he says you must come having turned to the lord away from your idolatry not being stiff-necked and yielding yourself fully to the lord and if you come in that condition oh you will get such a welcome and so we get on to the next uh, aspect of this passage in verse 2 it tells us that the king had taken counsel and his princes and all the congregation in Jerusalem to keep the Passover in the second month. Now, again, there's a bit of a problem here because normally the Passover would be, as we've learned, the 14th day of the first month. But if you remember that Hezekiah, he came to the throne in the first month, the first day of the month, and the first thing he did in uh, the first month of the year, uh, first year of his reign, first day of the month, he had them cleanse the temple. But if you look at chapter 29 and verse 17, notice it says, now they began on the first day of the first month to sanctify. And on the eighth day of the month came they to the porch of the Lord. So they sanctified the house of the Lord in eight days. And in the 16th day of the first month, they made an end. So this project of cleaning out the filth from the house of God, it took them 16 days. Okay. It tells us quite clearly uh, that in the 16th day of the first month, they made an end. The problem was the Passover was to be kept on the 14th day of the first month. <laughs> and so the house wasn't finished. It wasn't fully cleansed at that time and so there's a dilemma what do we do because remember they only kept the passover once a year and so if they miss it by two days then they have to wait a whole nother year before they can do it again and so it causes somewhat of a dilemma uh, by the way just to verify uh, when it should have been kept let me ask you to turn to leviticus 23 uh, and I'll just show you where we get this from. Verses 5 and 6 of Leviticus 23, it says, In the 14th day of the first month at even is the Lord's Passover, and on the 15th day of the same month is the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Unto the Lord, seven days you must eat unleavened bread. So clearly the 14th day of the first month is when they should have done it, but they couldn't because they're still on cleanness. They haven't finished cleaning the temple, and so they've got a problem. 
So what are they going to do? So they, they decided to take some counsel together. The king had taken counsel and his princes and all the congregation in Jerusalem to keep the Passover in the second month. Now, how did they come up with that? How did they decide that they can just do the Passover in the second month of the year? How did that come about? Well, I want you to go to the book of Numbers. And I want to suggest to you what happened is as they discussed this dilemma together, I believe that Hezekiah had a good grasp on the word of God. And he remembered a little obscure incident in the book of Numbers, chapter 9 and verses 10 and 11. And even though in this incident in Numbers 10 and 11, it was really only referring to some individuals, yet he was going to take this principle and apply it to everybody. Numbers 9, verse 10, it says this, Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, If any man of you or of your posterity shall be unclean by reason of a dead body or by it be in a journey afar off, yet he shall keep the Passover unto the Lord the 14th day of the second month at even, they shall keep it and eat it with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. And so he saw that if somebody, there was this clause uh, recognizing that if somebody is somehow unclean, and they can't do it on the 14th day of the first month, that there was this little clause there that there was a provision for them on the second month, 14th day. And so Hezekiah, knowing the word of God in consultation with others, he was a man who could listen to others and discuss with others too. Uh, the decision was made that they would keep the Passover on the second month because the whole thing was unclean. Uh, on the first month, it wasn't just one person, it was basically everybody, and so they would do it in the second month. So that was their decision. And again, you think that he must have pawed over the scriptures, meditated on these things. They're clearly, a man who is given to meditate, ponder the word of God. So, verse five, it says, So, uh, sorry, verse four. Um, <clears throat> Well, let me read from verse three. I'm jumping ahead. For they could not keep it at that time because the priests had not sanctified themselves sufficiently. Neither had the people gathered themselves together to Jerusalem. So not only was there an uncleanness problem, but if he's going to invite all Israel, you've got to allow some time for that too, for the delivering of the posts, for them to get cleaned up and for them to come. And so he takes that into account as well. And it says in verse four, the thing pleased the king and all the congregation. So they established a decree to make proclamation throughout all Israel from Beersheba. Uh, Beersheba is the southern tip of the land of Israel, even to Dan, which is the northern border of the land of Israel. So basically, they were going to cover the whole land. You often hear that phrase from Dan to Beersheba. Here it's the reverse from Beersheba even to Dan, and they're going to invite everybody to come to keep the Passover to the Lord God of Israel at Jerusalem, for they had not done it of a long time in such sort as it was written. Actually, I want to suggest to you that they hadn't done it, and we're going to learn it later on, since the days of Solomon. Okay? And part of the reason they hadn't done it since the days of Solomon is because the kingdom had been divided since the days of after Solomon. Remember, after Solomon died, his, two, his son, Rehoboam, Jeroboam, the division of the kingdom, and now, for the first time since the days of Solomon, Assyria has taken the bulk, including the king, of the northern kingdom into captivity. And so the invitation has gone out to the remnant that are left of the whole land. And so it's a, a wonderful, wonderful time. Uh, notice also, just from the appeal that he made in the letters, that his message was not one of political reunification. He doesn't say return to Judah, but what he says to them is return to the Lord. Uh, he, he reminds them that they had been spared the deportations. They'd escaped. Again, the end of verse 6. Ye children of Israel, turn again to the Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, 
and he'll return to the remnant of you that are escaped out of the hand of the kings of Assyria. So they, they'd escaped the captivity uh, themselves. They'd not been taken captive. They'd been spared the deportations. And God had given them a doorway of opportunity, a chance to repent and return to the Lord. And so again, we stress, uh, he's asking for genuine repentance. And I, I believe today the Holy Spirit is still looking for repentance from his people. One of the reasons why God's people are not being blessed in this day is that we're too stiff-necked and there's very little repentance going on amongst the people of God. And it's interesting that in Revelation 2 and 3, when he writes to the seven churches, we've already mentioned this, five out of seven of them are called to repentance. And if we would see blessing, if we would see revival, if we would see a real turning to God, there has to be genuine repentance. I'm thinking, uh, again, in terms of uh, the words of Solomon, and I believe this was at the very back of the mind of Hezekiah as he sends these posts out, is this statement in, in 2 Chronicles 7, verse 14. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves. That's the very opposite of being stiff-necked. It's, it's that humbleness, that humility. And pray and seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways, that's repentance, then will I hear from heaven, and will forgive their sins, and will heal their land. And I believe Hezekiah understood that, and he calls them to turn to the Lord in repentance, to not be stiff-necked, but to turn to the Lord. And so it says, um, uh, again, down in verse 8, uh, be not stiff-necked as your fathers were, but yield yourselves to the Lord. Enter into his sanctuary, which he has sanctified forever. Serve the Lord your God, that the fierceness of his wrath may turn away from you. And so he's given them this glorious window of opportunity to repent and to be restored to the Lord and to his house. Now, it's interesting to notice the response of this letter that hezekiah sends sends out it's a circular letter uh and we're going to suggest that i uh, just like i'm going to use the words of paul in second corinthians 2 16 to some the letter was a savor of death unto death to those that laughed and mocked and were content with their idolatry but to others it was a savor of life unto life just like the gospel itself so notice particularly in verses 10 and 11, we'll notice this. So the post passed from the city to city throughout the country of Ephraim and Manasseh, even to Zebulun. But they laughed them to scorn and mocked them. Nevertheless, diverse of Asher and Manasseh and of Zebulun humbled themselves and came to Jerusalem. And it's true that when we, when we go and tell men to be reconciled to God, when we're actively involved in gospel work, uh, beseeching men to, to be restored to the Lord, to, to uh, be reconciled to God, there's always going to be a mixed response. Some will mock and others will come in humility and brokenness and be gloriously restored to the Lord. Now, I want you to notice that if you're ever laughed at for the cause of the Lord, you are in glorious company. And so I'd like, I'd like to just look at some examples, please. Look at Nehemiah and <clears throat> chapter uh, 2, Nehemiah chapter 2 and verse 19. And we're going to see that great servants of God have been laughed at and laughed to scorn. Nehemiah 2 verse 19, it says, but when Sambalat, the Horonite, Tobiah, the servant, the Ammonite, and Geshem, the Arabian, heard it, they laughed us to scorn and despised us and said, what is this thing that ye do? Will ye rebel against the king? Again, they're just trying to build the house of God. They're trying to work for God and they're laughed to scorn by the people of the land. Look at Matthew's gospel and chapter 
9, Matthew chapter 9 and verse 24. Matthew 9, verse 24. He said unto them, Give place, for the maid is not dead, but sleepeth. This is Jairus' daughter. And notice what it says. And they laughed him to scorn. If you are laughed to scorn for the cause of Christ, well, you're in the company of the master himself. They laughed him to scorn. And we can expect it. Paul, when he was in Athens, they mocked his teaching on the resurrection from the dead. These, these clever Athenian philosophers, they, they, they mocked at him. And I guess the question comes to this. Are you and I willing to be counted to be a fool for Christ's sake? When we get aggressive in sharing the gospel, one of the things we can expect is there will be people who will mock and scoff and laugh and reject us quite clearly. But there will be those that will respond to our appeal and to the entreaty that we give to them to turn to the Lord. And I want you to look at Acts chapter 5. And I want to say that there's something missing, I think, in our generation. Now, maybe some of the Servants of the Lord in, in India, especially North India, they, they are aggressive in going with the gospel. And they're experiencing the very things we're talking about. Mockery, rejection, all these things. But here in this continent, uh, I think we rarely see this. Acts 5.41. They departed from the presence of the council. This is after being beaten. And it says, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. And so the question is, are we willing to be counted a fool? Are we willing to, to suffer shame for the name of Christ? Are we willing for that rejection? <clears throat> or do we just want a comfortable life? And so they go with these uh, posts and uh, as they, take them out there's this mixed response but thankfully as well as rejection there are those that humbled themselves and uh, from uh, various from asher manasseh zebulun and they came to jerusalem verse 12 also in judah the hand of god was to give them one heart to do the commandment of the king and of the princes by the word of the lord so there's great unity in judah and being joined now by people from the northern kingdom there assembled at Jerusalem much people to keep the Feast of Unleavened Bread in the second month, a very great congregation. Of course, we know the Passover, Unleavened Bread, they're all kind of together. Uh, it's a week-long festival. Passover's in there. First Fruits is in there. It's just a wonderful time. And, of course, there's a removing of leaven. There's a removing of that which is, uh, which is uh, speaks of evil leaven speaks of of sin and its permeating character and so they were to remove anything that was a picture of sin uh from their homes from their lives during this special week and again i want to notice as we look at our passage again that as they do this uh, notice verse 14 and they arose and took away the altars that were in jerusalem and all the altars for incense they took away and cast them into the brook Kindron, Kidron. So kind of remember last, last time they cleaned the debris out of the house of God. But now as the revival is spreading, there's this unity amongst the people of God. There's a desire to be right with God. And so everything that is a stumbling block that would take him away from the Lord, every, every altar, uh, that was not devoted to him in the city of Jerusalem was now taken and smashed up and once again thrown into the brook Kidron. So there's a great removal of rubbish. There's a great uh, dealing with sin. And there's a great desire uh, to be right with the Lord and a wonderful dealing amongst the people. 
And then it tells us in verse 15, they killed the Passover on the 14th day of the second month and the priests and the Levites were ashamed and sanctified themselves and brought in the burnt offerings to the house of the Lord. They stood in their place after their manner, according to the law of Moses, the man of God, the priests sprinkled the blood which they received at the hand of the Levites. He asked yourself, well, why were they ashamed? Well, I think one of the things they were ashamed of is what they'd done in the past. Remember, the priests were part of the problem during Ahaz's reign. They'd assisted and abetted in the departure. And now that they were back looking at the Passover lamb, being remembering of their past and their history, all of a sudden they're ashamed. And there is a sense, isn't there, when we've been away from the Lord and we come back and we're now received back to the Lord's Supper again. And when we hear about all he did and all he suffered, we think about what, how ashamed we are of what we did in our wayward times when we were away from the Lord. And there's that sense of, uh, I caused his suffering. It was my sin that caused him to be put on that tree. And there is that sense of great shame that comes to us. And so it says in verse 17, there were many in the congregation that were not sanctified. Therefore, the Levites had the charge of killing the Passovers for everyone that was not clean to sanctify them unto the Lord. For a multitude of the people, even many of Ephraim, Manasseh, Issachar, Zebulun, had not cleansed themselves. Yet did they eat the Passover otherwise than it was written. But Hezekiah prayed for them, saying, the good Lord pardon everyone. So here's a bit of a problem. You see, these people that had received the post remember they'd gone from dan to beersheba this invitation yeah, some of them maybe didn't have time to properly be ritually purified even though they set their hearts to seek the lord and humble themselves but you know they didn't have time to go through all the ritual and so we find that hezekiah was a man who knew how to pray and what he does is he intercedes for them a kind of a picture of that coming king priest uh, who will intercede for his people. And so we see something of Hezekiah praying for them, saying, the good Lord, pardon everyone that prepares his heart to seek God, the Lord God of his fathers, verse 19, though he be not cleansed according to the purification of the sanctuary. And notice verse 20, the Lord hearkened to Hezekiah and healed the people. And so we could say one of the things about this king, at this point in his life, he's a man in touch with God. He can pray and the Lord responds to his prayer uh, because he's seen his heart, seen his zeal for the house of God. And so uh, these people are graciously forgiven uh, for their not having time to fully purify themselves. Their hearts are to seek the Lord. Hezekiah prays and they respond. respond. And so again, he's a man who knows the word of God and he's a man who knows how to pray. Or oh, how we need leaders among us today who not only know the word of God, but know how to pray, that know how to lay hold on God. And that's what we find in godly King Hezekiah, both of these marvelous traits. And we also notice in verse 22, it says, that Hezekiah spake comfortably to all the Levites that taught the good knowledge of the Lord. And they did eat throughout the feast seven days, offering peace offerings and making confession to the Lord God of their fathers. So while the servants of God, the priests, are actively doing their work, and there's several aspects of what they're doing, they're teaching the word of God, uh, they're offering sacrifices, they're worshiping, and they're speaking. And yet Hezekiah speaks comfortable words to them that taught the good knowledge of the Lord. In other words, he's seeking to encourage the servants of God, those that taught the word of God, those that were bringing priestly service, uh, offering offerings to the Lord. He sought in every way he could to encourage them. He spake comfortably to them. Oh, how we need today men who will encourage the people of God. Men who will encourage those that labor in the word and doctrine. Men that will encourage those that are true worshipers and go up to them and say, say maybe a young man just getting started and he's sincere and he's talking to the Lord at, at the Lord's Supper. What a wonderful thing to have a leader who come alongside 
And instead of, uh, you know, kind of because he didn't get all his P's and Q's correct, uh, giving him a rebuke, encourage him. Oh, how we need encouragers. He's an encourager. He speaks comfortably. And uh, I, I want you to notice what happens next. This is quite marvelous. It says, the whole assembly, verse 23, took counsel to keep other seven days, and they kept other seven days with gladness. So they had this seven-day feast on leavened bread, and they had such a wonderful time in the presence of God that nobody wanted to go home. And they said, shall we do another week? Now, isn't that something? How would you like it if you were uh, having a conference, your assembly, and it was such a blessed time that everybody said, nothing else matters. Work can wait. Life can wait. Let's stay here. Let's have another week. Wouldn't that be something? See, in times of revival, time is meaningless. You, you read about revivals, uh, when God is working, people don't want to go home. Uh, the preachers will dismiss the meeting and nobody will leave. They just stay there. They want more. They're hungry for more. And they'll plead with them to leave. No, they won't. And they'll, they'll stay and they'll be singing hymns all night long. And the very next day, they'll go to work and they'll have all the energy they need. It's just like the Lord infuses through his presence a life uh, to the whole thing that is just marvelous. And so they did something that was absolutely unique as far as we're aware in the whole history of Israel is that they had the Feast of Unleavened Bread and they were so blessed, they did a repeat performance the second week. What an amazing revival this is. And so it says in verse 24, for Hezekiah, king of Judah, did give to the congregation a thousand bullocks and 7,000 sheep and the princes gave to the congregation a thousand bullocks, 10,000 sheep, and a great number of priests sanctified themselves. And remember, during Ahaz's reign, the house of God, the doors were shut. And it's almost like the Lord is restoring those years that the locusts had eaten. And you see the, the sacrificial giving of Hezekiah here. And yet the Lord is no man's debtor. Uh, I believe he's operating ahead of the game in terms of understanding the principle the Lord Jesus would teach. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. And so the king gives uh, absolutely generously, and yet notice how the Lord prospered him. Look at chapter 31 and verse 21. It says, In every work that he began in the service of the house of God and in the law, and in the commandments to seek his God, he did it with all his heart and prospered. Chapter 32, verse 27. And Hezekiah had exceeding much riches and honor. He made himself treasuries of silver and for gold and for precious stones and for spices and for shields and for all manner of pleasant jewels. Storehouses also for the increase of corn and wine and oil and a stalls for all manner of beasts, and coats for flocks. Moreover, he provided him cities and possessions of flocks, and herds in abundance, for God had given him substance very much. And I want you to get the principle. The principle is this. You will never outgive God. God is no man's debtor. I think it was John Newton. Pretty sure it was John Newton. He said, um, yep, I think it was. He said this, there was a man, some called him mad. The more he gave, the more he had. And I think that just that principle that God will is no man's debtor. And so there's this tremendous outpouring of generosity. The king giving graciously uh, of all these bullocks and, and sheep and all the rest of it. And yet, as we've seen, God prospers him for he sees the man's heart and responds to it. And so it says all the congregation of Judah with the priests, the Levites, and all the congregation that came out of Israel and the strangers that came out of the land of Israel and that dwelt in Judah rejoiced. So there was great joy in Jerusalem. But since the time of Solomon, the son of David, king of Israel, there was not the like in Jerusalem. 
So this Passover was the greatest event of significance since the days of Solomon. In many ways, first of all, it included all the 10 tribes. The message went out to all the 10 tribes. That had not happened since the days of Solomon. Secondly, it was the only one we read of in scripture where they actually had it twice. They had a 14 day festival instead of seven. And so the testimony of the word of God is since the time of Solomon, the son of David, king of Israel, there was not like the like in Jerusalem. This was a marvelous time. And it says the priests, the Levites arose and blessed the people. The voice was heard. And their prayer came up to his holy dwelling place, even unto heaven. And so what amazing, amazing revival we have witnessed under Hezekiah, the king of Judah. And I don't know about you, but it makes me long to see a revival in our day. To see the people of God so excited about the things of God that time doesn't matter. That they're not watching their clocks. They're not thinking about other things, but they're just basking in the presence of God. And that there's this desire to include all this this burden to reach out with a ministry of reconciliation to others. There's this desire to encourage those that serve the Lord. And there's, there's this generosity. There's all of these beautiful things that we're witnessing. This is what happens in time of revival. And we need to be those that are not content with going through the motions and the status quo and begin to cry out to the Lord in the words of Psalm uh, 85 and verses 6 and 7 wilt thou not revive us again that thy people might rejoice in thee and notice how we ended this it says the priests the levites arose and blessed the people their voice was heard great time of blessing great joy great rejoicing and their prayer came up to his holy dwelling place even unto heaven. May God encourage us with this quite remarkable passage of the word of God. Let's pray. Our Father, we would ask of thee that we might see these kind of days in our time. Uh, we're living in days of barrenness. We're living in days of departure and failure. And Lord, we long to see better days, days when, when we meet together to remember the Lord Jesus, it's like a piece of heaven on earth where there's such a sense of reality that the people are not distracted, but they are just in love with Christ. Lord, would you do a work in our day? Lord, would you restore backsliders like you did to those of Manasseh and Ephraim and these Zebulun and these places, restore backsliders to thyself and do a mighty work in our day. We'll give thee the glory in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.